Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm Jill Melandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Joining us for this segment, we have Anjali Mitta. She's founder and CEO of Diesel Labs. We're going to take a look at leveraging generative AI as an additive, not a replacement, and multidimensional methods of content measurement. It is great to have you with us, Anjali. Welcome to Trade Talks. Thank you so much for having me. You got it. Let's talk about some of the benefits of generative AI models when you're making decisions on the back end of mm -hmm. the content. Mm -hmm. I mean, gosh, in Hollywood, we've been using data for decades to make decisions. So so what's really neat about this new so this new phase, if you will, with generative AI is that we can now make decisions faster and even more intelligently than ever before. I think ultimately it really comes down to the precision and the quality of the data you're using so that, that will you ultimately put through these models in support of your business decisions, but it's certainly an exciting time. So it sounds like you can use this to make better decisions in terms of distribution and viewership models and trying to gauge what the audience wants right now. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So we have learned, for example, through our data that it's in fact predictive of how many people are going to show up to watch streaming content, for example. And so when you think of the power of that kind of information, it helps you, you know, if you're a dis distributor, p content producer, figure out what to make. What are you missing in your portfolio of content? And how do you actually get your message in front of those right audiences, especially now when all of us are watching content in so many different places? And of course, you know, generative AI, it's been the news with the strike, the writer's strike and everything. Um, so what's your thoughts on where does it have its place in the media landscape? In my opinion, I, to your point, mm -hmm. it is additive. I think it allows creators to be more creative and people behind the scenes to make better decisions so that the content is better. Mm -hmm. I, I, f I agree and I think that what's cool about this moment is, is that we're asking all the right questions. You and I have lived through enough you know, phases of technology where sometimes you just kind of barrel through and then you realize the side effects of your decisions later. What's neat about this is that we are asking these questions now. How should it be used creatively? How should it be used for you know, summarizing content? How should it be used to de develop predictive analytics, for example, which is where we sit? And so I think all of the right questions are being asked and it's really rewarding to see the whole industry come together to figure out how we're going to make use of this tech to make even better content than ever before. Let's talk about the model of viewership data as it exists now. And in your notes, you said it, it's a walled garden <laughs> model. What does it? What do you mean by that? So, for example, we pull all of our data from the you know social and video platforms out there. So, anytime you go to a platform like Facebook or YouTube or TikTok to express yourself about content, these are technically walled gardens, and thus it takes a lot of effort to structure that data in a way where they are, it can then be used to derive insight. So that's part of what our secret sauce is, if you will, is to take these huge, unstructured, very messy data sets and turn them into something that's, you know, plug and play essentially for our partners in the media space. So more multi-dimensional methods versus having to go to the gatekeepers, yep. you know, the intermediaries here. So it sounds like this is part of that Web3 movement as well, where the data is more sophisticated, um, it's more protected for consumers of content, but it, it's more robust when you're trying to make these decisions in, in terms of creating content that's, that's valuable. I think that's exactly right, where we have more intelligence than ever before, but we're also doing it in a way that's very ethical and essentially supporting and protecting the privacy of anyone who might be out there sharing their thoughts and feelings. That's something we take great care in doing, um, and it's good to see some legislation come about to protect right. users as well, but we've kind of always thought that you know this is a very important part of our underlying process and so we've always adhered to those high levels, uh, you know, those high standards. Which is interesting because I, I feel like when it comes to content moderation, when it comes to data protection and so forth, areas around the world such as the UK, such mm -hmm. as the EU, very well known for their data privacy standards and so forth, it, it seems as if we're lacking a bit in terms of the framework here in the US. <laughs> We're catching up. Right. I think we're catching up, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it in the coming months and years, especially with regard to generative AI, because it opens the door to all these questions of who owns the underlying data on which these models are trained. Who, you know, do you own when you ask a question of one of these models? Do you own the question itself, or does that now become a part intrinsically of the model itself? And so these are all things that are going to have to get worked out. But you know, in terms of where we are in the cycle, we're we're very early, uh, I would say, in the overall, you know, our overall understanding of all the different ways that this generative AI tech is going to help us make products and services better for people, um, help us make decisions faster, help us, you know, con make conclusions faster, whether it be in healthcare or media in our case. All right. Appreciate the insight, Anjali. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. And thanks for joining me. I'm Jill Melandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.